what we're going to do today is um, is talk about uh, background and significance. And I'm going to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about how to keep up with the medical literature and um, how to manage your references. So I'm not sure how you guys are currently managing your literature searches and whether you have a systematic way of reading journals or keeping up with um, uh, what's new in your field of interest. Maybe um, everyone could just take a, a second or two to type into the into the chat box if they have um, some sort of, of systematic way of, of keeping up with new neurology or epilepsy publications. And I'll um, I'll go through and, and discuss them at some uh, at some point during the during the talk. So I'm going to um, go through today how to write a background and significance section, and it's going to be a pretty short discussion. <laughs> um, but it does not mean that you can give short shrift to this when you're actually writing your grant application. But I think this is a reasonable place to start um, because it will allow you to um, uh, review the existing literature in your um, uh, research field and um, really set the stage for your research project. And then when you actually write the background and significance section, you may not include every single paper that you read in order to get up to date with the research field, um, but at least you'll have a command of what's already been done and, and what um, uh, your research project is going to add to, um, uh, to the research field. So, um, so the background and significance um, section is one of the uh, components of the research proposals that you guys will be developing. And um, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, about that. Um, so this section of a grant is designed for you to explain to the reviewers why the work that you're doing is important and put your research proposal into context in terms of what's already been done and what could be done in the future. And it's really important that this section engage your reviewers. This is where you know, you really make the case that this particular research project is important and should be funded. And you also want to lead your reviewer down a path that goes logically from what's already known to where the gaps are in knowledge to how your research project is going to fill that gap and allow future progress to be made in your field. Um, and um, so this is really a critical section to make sure that your reviewers understand um, where this project fits in, in terms of um, the overall research strategy in your particular area of interest. Now the NIH um, proposals, R01s, R21s, et cetera, now only include significance. They don't call it background and significance anymore. <laughs> And so some people kind of leave out or forget that um, many reviewers may not be familiar with all of the research that's been done in your particular field. As, uh, as a matter of fact, many of the people may be quite unfamiliar with what's already been done. So you do still need to give some overview of the research that's already been done in a particular area. But you want to try to keep this whole section to about a page and a half to two pages. Um, uh, out of the 12 pages that are allowed for R01s and six pages for R21. So um, this is going to be um, a much shorter part of your grant than the research um, approach, um, but is still critically important. And you definitely want to make sure that you spend enough time on this and have a command of, of what's already been done. You don't want to submit a grant that um, uh, is a project that we already know the answer to. So these are the instructions from NIH on how to uh, write your significant section. So um, they ask the, um, the applicant to explain the importance of the problem or the critical barrier to progress in the field that the proposed project addresses. So why is this project important? Explain how the project will improve scientific knowledge, technical capability, and or clinical practice in one or more broad fields. 
So now take your project and put it into context of what's known and not known in the field. And then finally, talk about how um, concepts or methods or technologies or treatments will be changed if your proposed project is successful. How is this going to influence future research? Um, and so this is a pretty um, uh, structured way to write the significant section. So you want to sort of briefly sketch the background. You don't want to do an exhaustive literature review. You know, the, the uh, reviewers don't really have time to become an expert in your research area, but you definitely want to highlight um, uh, what's already been done, and particularly if there are controversies in the field, acknowledge those controversies. Acknowledge um, uh, investigators who may have opposing views to you, and make sure that you put your work um, into context of what's already been done. Um, you want to make sure that you give a balanced view of what already exists in the field, focusing on things that have been done recently, um, and sometimes even projects in progress. And you want to make sure that you have uh, citations from the from the medical literature. So you want to um, give credit to your colleagues who have also been working in the field. As I mentioned before, you then want to specifically identify where there are gaps in knowledge. Um, talk about the importance and the health relevance of the research that you're proposing, and identify the next logical stage. And in this section, you also want to highlight why you and your team are the best qualified to do this research project. You don't want it to be a generic project that could be done by anyone, but based on your prior work, your experience, um, your expertise, why is your team really best poised to do this research project? So, um, so a suggested outline is to use paragraph one to introduce the prob problem, paragraph two to give additional background um, and uh, a brief literature review that should be very focused and um, highlight the most recent advances. Um, paragraph three, you're going to talk about what the significance is of your um, uh, proposed project. And then um, uh, in the next paragraph, emphasize the significance in a broader context. You know, where, where does this fit into um, uh, the entire research field? How is this going to enhance new knowledge? And then end um, the significance section with a summary statement that really crystallizes for the reviewer um, uh, why your problem is so important and why you should get funding to, to, to do the project. Um, these are just some brief suggestions to how to format the background. This fits with what we talked about last time in terms of paying attention to the structure of your grant and how your grant looks because that's going to um, uh, make it much easier for your reviewer to read the proposal and to, um, and to um, uh, you know, kind of summarize in their own minds the, uh, why the project is important. Um, so you really want to kind of lead the reviewer step by step um, through those different aspects of significance. So you want to use um, topic sentences to introduce the paragraph. So why is this prob problem important? This project is important because um, uh, the next section would be, you know, previous research has highlighted, um, uh, you know, X um, uh, gap in the field. Um, uh, use transitions that uh, allow you to flow from one idea to the next. Um, end your paragraphs with closing sentences. Again, um, the reviewers have lots of things to review, and so the more summarization you can do, the less the time they have to spend summarizing things themselves. And so, you know, have clear introductory sentences that tell the reviewer what you're going to talk about in that paragraph and then summarize the information in the closing sentence and summarize the entire section in your closing statement. Um, and that makes it very, very easy for the reviewer to find um, uh, you know, the, the criteria that they're going to use in order to judge your, uh, your grant. If you're going to use abbreviations, use them sparingly. It's very um, uh, cumbersome to reviewers to have to 
keep looking to a list of abbreviations. I mean, there are some things that you just have to abbreviate because they're too long. If you do that, make sure you provide a list. Uh, and definitions of all of the abbreviations that you're using and um, uh, use them sparingly. Try to organize it in an outline form. Again, that really allows the reviewer to focus on um, the most important parts of the grant. If you've structured it in a way that, you know, those four paragraphs that I talked about, it's very easy to find paragraph one, paragraph two. Um, and uh, and uh, be able to summarize the information. And although some people say that you shouldn't put a lot of um, pictures or figures, I think judicious use of pictures and figures in the significant section can be very, very helpful. You can really summarize a lot of information with um, with a good um, uh, with a good picture. Um, you don't want to, you know, have huge images that take up most of your space. Um, but um, if you do have a summary table or um, a, a graph that, that summarizes you know, previous literature, for example, that may be very, very helpful to include in the uh, significant section. Now the other um, uh, section that um, is somewhat related to the significant section is um, innovation. So this is another one of the review criteria for NIH grants. And um, uh, so in, in the innovation section, you're really going to talk about how your application um, challenges and seeks to shift current research or clinical practice paradigms. So this kind of builds on your sort of future directions part of significance. Um, but specifically identifies the part of your research proposal that's unique and groundbreaking um, and how this is going to uh, influence research in your um, clinical research area. Um, so I think of the innovation sort of as a, uh, an extension of the significant section of the grant, highlighting how you differ from all the research that's done before in terms of methodology or techniques and how your um, uh, proposal is going to um, provide new tools or new methodologies or new um, hypotheses that are going to change uh, the research field. Um, so some common errors in this include too little detail, so not giving a framework for the reviewers to really understand why this project is, is important in your um, research area. It can also though, be problematic to include too much detail. So again, if this is an exhaustive literature review, nobody really wants to read that. You really want to try to pull out the references um, that um, are most pertinent to your research project and the things that are uh, most recent and most cutting edge. Um, poor organization, as I mentioned before, you really want to lay this out in a logical um, uh, order so that your reviewer can clearly see, you know, exactly where your project fits in the whole framework of your field. Um, uh, not including co um, contradictory evidence or controver uh, controversial approaches can be problematic. There are likely to be reviewers who are very um, aware of these contradictory views and if you don't um, give credit to in other investigators who have different methods. Um, you're not going to be seen as someone who has a good command of the research literature in this area. Um, so you want to make sure um, uh, that you pay attention to, um, uh, to what already has been done um, by other people in your field. And then finally, um, overstating the potential uh, significance. So um, you, you want to highlight why this is an important research project and how it's going to change um, research, but you know, this isn't going to cure cancer or you know, make epilepsy go away. So you definitely don't want to overstate what the potential significance of your work is. Uh, for the rest of this session is talk a little bit about um, both doing the literature review for the significant section of your proposal, 
but also just in general, how to keep up with the ever-increasing flood of literature in your um, research field, even if you're um, subspecializing and just trying to keep up with the epilepsy literature, it never ends, and it's, it can be very, very difficult to figure out how to keep up with the most important um, clinical and research advance, uh, advances. And so, I'm going to talk a little bit about some strategies that you might be helpful uh, that might be helpful to you. So, um, so the last time we talked about um, how to begin to research your um, clinical research question, how to um, uh, take a first stab at review of the medical literature. So you want to, you know, take your research question and match it to the best medical information uh, research uh, resource. And eventually you'll have to go to the primary medical literature. You'll have to go to PubMed or some other database and find the original articles and read them in order to get a full understanding of the research area. But you may want to actually start with something that's a little bit more pre-processed so that you don't have to, you know, review and apprise and analyze each of the individual papers before you have a good idea of what the overall um, field looks like. And so once you have your focused clinical question, you may actually want to start with um, a pre-filtered evidence-based medicine research resource that actually um, summarizes the available literature, grades the available literature in terms of um, the strength of the, uh, the validity of the studies, and use that as a springboard to dive deeper into the particular research question. Um, so if we're looking at, you know, places to review the medical literature, you know, evidence-based medicine resources are often a really good place to start because they reduce the amount of time that you have to spend reading individual papers. But as we talked about last time, much of what's available in neurology is not evidence-based or has a fairly low rating in terms of evidence. And so you may not find a lot of information in pre-filtered evidence-based medicine resources, and I'll, I'll give some examples of that as we go through the, the rest of the talk. Um, so some other places that you can find information is in non-evidence-based reviews. So an example of this would be um, up to date, um, which, um, which does do a fairly good job in reviewing the uh, medical literature on a particular topic, but doesn't explicitly rate the quality of that evidence. Um, you may also be able to get some information from curated literature lists, so um, uh, online or paper um, versions of abstracts and manuscripts that have been reviewed by um, another researcher or clinician and assigned a rating and um, uh, is placed into the context of a particular field, and I'll show you some examples of, of this as we go um, through this. And then finally, you want to go, um, once you have a, an overview of the field, you want to go to the original literature and look at the original papers and the, and the um, uh, strength of the information present in those papers. Um, so there are um, several systems that are available that are designed to regularly update clinical evidence and provide um, uh, highly valid evidence-based recommendations to physicians. An example of this is um, the clinical evidence um, that's run by um, ACP. Hang on a second. I have all of these pulled up on the. Um, so this is uh, this clinical evidence site is run uh, by the um, British Medical Journal, and um, so you can actually just type into here epilepsy. You can look at different types of epilepsy, and so it it um, gives an a bunch of information about um, what evidence is available in epilepsy and categorizes it in terms of its uh, whether it's a systematic overview or whether the um, uh, paper was um, done according to um, the grade recommendations. So these are 
um, uh, quality of the evidence that's available. So here's an example of the great evaluation of interventions for epilepsy. So yeah, so here's one of the downsides of using these evidence-based um, websites is that they cost money. <laughs> so if your institution doesn't have a subscription to BMJ Clinical Evidence, then you get this error message. And although I do have access to it, if I were in my institution, I am not there right now, so I can't get access to this. Um, but um, it can be quite helpful to um, to basically look at the type of information that's available, what type of a paper it is. So here are some systematic overviews of treatment of generalized seizures, um, treatments with behavioral, psychological, ketogenic diet, um, and these are um, uh, done with um, a specific methodology that allows you to rate the quality of the evidence. Um, so this may be a reasonable place to start. Um, but I think it's immediately clear that there's not a whole lot of information here. We basically have uh, uh, several systematic overviews, one, two, three, that are actually related to epilepsy as opposed to something else. And um, probably most of your research topics that you guys are interested in pursuing are not going to be either you know, generalized seizure treatment or ketogenic diet treatment or absence seizures in children. So um, this um, highlights both how useful it can be to have the, um, uh, the systematic overview and the rating of the evidence, but also that there's not a whole lot of highly rated evidence in many areas in neurology. <clears throat> um, so these are a list of a couple of other um, online clinical evidence um, uh, websites. And again, most of them are subscriptions. And if your library, uh, university library doesn't um, subscribe to them, then you have to pay for individual access to them, which is also problematic. Um, the next are sort of synopses of, um, of studies. And these are um, uh, basically services where a reviewer will be assigned to review a particular paper or will choose to review a particular paper. And they will then um, give an overview of the quality of the methodology and place the study, um, the research, into um, the appropriate clinical context. And many of these um, uh, synopsis services also provide alerts when new um, summaries or new synopses are available. So an example of, it, of this is the American uh, College of Physicians Journal Club. So I'll show you an example of that. Um, uh, you can find the website here at acpjc.org, and that's the electronic version of the ACP Journal Club. And what they do is they have 130 medical journals that are searched for any papers that are um, uh, methodologically sound and clinically re relevant to a particular area of medicine. Um, and those studies are, um, are then uh, summarized and graded in terms of the strength of the study and put into the appropriate clinical context. And then the articles are re-reviewed every five years to make sure that the information is still appropriate based on advances in the medical field. Um, there's a structured abstract that's done and expert commentary um, attached to each of the synopses. And it reviews internal medicine, OBGYN, family medicine, pediatrics, psychiatry, and surgery. And I would note that neurology is not in this list. Um, so um, uh, there are some neurology studies that are, um, that are done in the synopsis um, system, but they are few and far between. And then um, uh, it also requires a subscription. And so you'll have to check with your university library to see whether this is available for you. It would be very nice if we had an, a, a version of this for neurology, but it does not exist. So here's an example of what the ACP Journal Club looks like. And so um, it summarizes new evidence for patient care from 130 clinical journals. Um, 
and um, gives a list of all of the journal articles that are reviewed each year. And then, um, so here's an example that is relevant to neurology. So um, this is a, a study uh, reviewing um, apixaban for atrial fibrillation uh, in terms of stroke or systemic embolism uh, risk compared with warfarin. So it takes the original source citation, it gives a clinical impact rating uh, in terms of whether or not it changes practice. <clears throat> it has an abstract um, from the original article, and then it goes through in a structured way and um, talks about <coughs> the methodology of the paper, whether it was randomized and blinded, um, the follow-up period, and whether the follow-up um, for, uh, proportion of patients followed up was adequate, um, summarizes the inclusion and the exclusion criteria, defines the intervention that was given, and um, talks about the outcomes and the main results. And then there's a commentary that puts this into um, uh, overall context of the field. And this is written by, you know, a stroke expert um, in this case. So again, this can be a really nice way to um, uh, look at the most important and clinically relevant papers in your um, particular area, but there are not too many that are um, available for, um, uh, for neurology. And this goes all the way back to 2003. So this is the um, paper uh, version, so um, alerts are published. I think once a month and goes out to um, people who subscribe to this um, uh, basically synopsis system. Um, one of the other downsides of this um, type of a subscription service is that there's going to be a delay in terms of when you're going to hear about these studies, if this is your main method of keeping up with the medical literature, because once the paper is published, it then needs to be selected for review reviewed and then posted, and so there can be six to nine months um, between the time a paper is initially published to the time that it's summarized in, um, in the uh, journal club. Um, there's also, um, from the American College of Physicians, uh, clinical practice guidelines, and these are evidence-based reviews of um, uh, the medical literature addressing, you know, specific um, uh, medical problems, again, most of them are most uh, applicable to general medicine, internal medicine, and not so much to neurology, but some of them do um, overlap a little bit with neurology. Um, what's more um, appropriate for neurology is um, the uh, American Academy of Neurology Clinical Practice Guidelines, and we'll We'll talk about that. So that's the neurology process for evidence-based review, and they've published a whole series of clinical practice guidelines that we talked about uh, the last time, and um, that's, uh, I think, our preferred source for evidence-based um, reviews in neurology. All right, so the next um, place that you may get uh, information from our uh, systematic reviews and some of the available medical information. So probably the main site for or the main resource for this type of uh, resource would be the Cochrane Collaboration. And um, so Cochrane is an international organization that prepares, maintains, and disseminates systematic reviews, um, mostly um, uh, reviews of controlled, uh, randomized controlled therapy. And they have several different databases. So there's a database of systematic reviews, reviews of effectiveness, and then a controlled clinical trials registry. And in addition to having all of this information about studies that have already been done and, and the systematic reviews of them, it also has an incredible amount of information on how to conduct a systematic review. So if you're ever interested in doing a systematic review of the literature on a particular topic, the Cochrane um, Library is, is a place to go. Um, so here's an example of the database of systematic reviews. 
in neurology, they have 74 um, reviews that have been done in epilepsy. Unfortunately, <coughs> some of these reviews are simply, we did a systematic review of, for randomized controlled trials of X therapy for X type of epilepsy, and we found no literature that actually matches those criteria. So some of the systematic uh, reviews are, are quite short and say there basically is no highly rated evidence in a particular area. Um, so that's a little bit problematic. Um, they uh, include new reviews as well as updated reviews. <clears throat> and so the um, systematic reviews are, are um, assigned uh, to be updated every five years or so. And these are, this is just a one month list um, of uh, new reviews that were available the last time I went to the Cochrane database. And of these, I think there were at least some epilepsy ones. Yeah, so comparison of anti-epileptic drugs, no treatment or placebo for children with benign epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes. Now the Cochrane database is also a subscription service and so you need to pay in order to have access to this or your library has to have a subscription um, to it for you to use it, but um, uh, if you can't get to the Cochrane database itself, most of the reviews are also published uh, and available in PubMed, so you're, you should be able to get access to it through your library service. Um, you can also look at systematic reviews from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and through the National uh, Clearinghouse so this will get evidence-based guidelines that are from societies other than neurology societies. Um, so for example, in epilepsy, um, you might be interested in bone health and you could go to the, you know, rheumatology society's recommendations on screening for bone density in patients with, you know, on drugs that increase the risk for bone loss that might be applicable to, to epilepsy. So, um, oftentimes you'll find some component of guidelines that are written for a broader audience that are applicable to your particular research area and it's useful to, to be able to find those guidelines. Um, so here's the uh, web page for the HQRQ um, and they um, organize their guidelines by topic and so we have all of the Central nervous system diseases, 357. Mm -hmm. um, so here's the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea in adults, clinical practice guideline um, from the American College of Physicians. And you could see what, you know, if there were any references to evaluation and treatment of sleep apnea in patients with epilepsy, if that were your particular interest. In terms of the neurology evidence, I already mentioned the AAF practice guidelines. Um, there's also an evidence-based neurology journal club uh, website um, that's run by the um, University of Western Ontario. Um, so here's an example of their evidence-based neurology page um, in secondary stroke prevention, HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors reduce the incidence of fatal and non-fatal strokes and total mortality. And again, like the ACP Journal Club, they um, give a clinical summary, they summarize the evidence, they reproduce um, some of the data from the original study, and then there's a clinical commentary at the end that um, puts this into context of research that's already been done. Um, so this is the evidence-based neurology um, website. Um, so they have, uh, you know, papers like ethosuximide and early post-stroke seizure. The problem is, is that this doesn't seem to be being updated very much. Um, so I don't know that they're doing a lot of new reviews. Um, so the last um, updates seem to be back in, in 2014. Um, so you can look for this site for um, uh, sort of historical information, but it doesn't seem to be a, a great source for ongoing information, but it is free. <clears throat> you could also um, think about looking at curated literature lists. So what do I mean by that? This means that there are papers 
that are chosen by a panel of reviewers to be of interest to the field and are then uh, summarized and placed into clinical context um, by the reviewers. And a good example of this is the AES publication, Epilepsy Currents, which um, uh, takes uh, papers uh, published within the last six months and um, summarizes them and, and, again, puts them into clinical context uh, with a short editorial. Um, so this can be very, very useful um, for um, seeing, you know, sort of where the field is in a particular, at a particular time point. Um, the downsides to these types of curated lists, um, uh, there's another one here called Faculty 1000 Medicine, which is very similar, but for all of medicine, not just epilepsy. Um, the downsides are that um, what is chosen by the reviewers can be pretty idiosyncratic and so um, it's not a systematic review of the literature and there's not really an attempt to um, review every single paper that's important in epilepsy or in neurology or in medicine, but what's of interest to the reviewer. Um, so that if your research area Area, you know, doesn't strike the fancy of one of the editorial boards, then they're not going to be uh, writing reviews on topics of interest to you. And the second is, again, the delay um, introduced by the fact that the reviewer has to find the paper, review it, it has to be peer reviewed, and then published before you have access to this expert commentary. Um, so it, again, introduces a delay between the time of the primary publication and, and when you have access to it. Um, I will say, though, that Epilepsy Currents is a really good way of keeping up with sort of the hottest areas and the most important research areas in, in epilepsy. There's also a couple of other online collections. One is ResearchGate. Another is Mendeley, where um, uh, People who are doing research in particular areas um, can post their papers or their um, bibliographies, and um, uh, you can actually follow specific authors and get alerts when they publish new papers. Um, so if you have, if you know, you know, people, groups of people who are publishing in your particular research area, you can sign up to one of these services to be notified every time they have a new. Um, publication, so that um, can be very useful. I'm just going to show a couple of examples of these. Um, so this is um, F1000 Prime, this is Faculty 1000 Medicine. Um, so here um, are my sections and keywords, so I have stuff pulled up for epilepsy. Um, so here's one in epilepsy and physical e exercise, so you can click on this. Um, uh, again, it's given a rating in terms of very good, excellent, etc. Tells you a little bit about who reviewed the article. Um, uh, gives you the abstract from the original publication, and um, and then uh, the reviewer writes a brief commentary talking about the methodology of the paper and where this fits into the research environment, and then um, uh, members who um, uh, use Faculty 1000 um, can actually post comments related to the original commentary. So it becomes a little bit of a group discussion on a particular uh, topic. And if you go to article recommendations, you can actually see a whole list of um, everything that's been published. So here we'll do neurologic disorders, and we'll go to epilepsy. And you can see, um, you know, all of the recent papers that have been tagged for epilepsy. And there's a relatively short delay because these reviews, um, the commentaries are fairly short. They, you know, they don't have to be pages and pages long. So the reviewers are usually pretty good about um, publishing their uh, commentaries pretty quickly after the papers come out. So here's an example of pre-hospital treatment with levetiracetam plus clonazepam. And status epilepticus, um, just talking about you know where this paper fits in terms of other pre-hospital research and in, in status epilepticus. 
um, and tells you where this fits in terms of the relevant sections. And we'll also give other related articles to, um, to this, either from F1000, um, but also does a um, uh, related articles in, in PubMed, if applicable. Um, so that's Faculty 1000. And then um, this is Epilepsy Currents. I'm sure you guys have all seen Epilepsy Currents. Um, so here's the current issue. Um, they have reviews um, that um, are on specific topics. And then um, they have uh, both clinical literature, uh, clinical science um, papers, and basic science papers. So here we have um, linking anatomy, connectivity, and physiology and epilepsy. To be a reviewer for epilepsy currents, you have to be good at writing snappy titles for your commentaries. <laughs> Everybody has to have a nice interest-grabbing uh, commentary, uh, interest-grabbing title. Um, so this is always published with um, the original, the abstract from the original paper. Um, uh, so this looks at abnormal connectivity and developmental epilepsy. Um, and then there's a commentary um, that talks about the pros and cons of the methodology of the paper, um, what this means for this particular clinical area of research, and then a brief list of uh, related references. Um, so again, this can be really useful of sort of getting a, a, a quick overview of, of uh, hot topics in, in epilepsy, both clinical research and, and uh, basic science research. Um, close some of these things here. Um, so then we can move on to non-evidence-based resources. So a good example of this is up to date. Um, and um, so these are fairly comprehensive reviews of specific uh, diseases in medicine. They have a very nice uh, neurology section and they have multiple uh, reviews in, uh, in epilepsy. They're not uh, evidence-based publications, so they don't actually specifically or explicitly grade the level of evidence for particular papers, but they can um, uh, really be a good resource for you to find um, an overview of studies that have already been done in a particular area of clinical research. Uh, and then you can go and sort of rate the evidence yourself. Um, so the reference list can be very, very helpful in, in up-to-date and really point you to the, to the most up-to-date um, uh, recommendations. And then you can also get uh, general news and updates from publications like Neurology Today and Medscape Neurology, um, uh, which is, uh, I think, these um, Services are sometimes good to um, sort of see what's of public interest and sort of hot topics from meetings and um, uh, recent recent research publications. They're somewhat problematic to use as a um, a way to keep up with the medical literature for two reasons. One, they're often written from a, a, a medical science writer perspective rather than a researcher perspective and so the uh, level of medical, the level of validity, the level of evidence is rarely specifically described in the summaries. Um, and second, um, uh, there can be a delay to the time that these are, that these are published. Um, and they may not actually even include the reference to the specific citation that the article came from. But Again, they can be useful to kind of give you a heads up to what's hot in a particular um, clinical area. And then finally, you can go to the original or primary studies. Um, when you do this, however, you have to do your own evaluation and quality rating before you can determine, you know, how reliable the study is in terms of uh, the data that's presented. Um, so to go to the original literature, I think most of us are familiar with PubMed and how to do searches in PubMed or in Ovid. 
Um, your library may also um, subscribe to other databases like the ISI Web of Science. That can be particularly helpful because it includes a lot of abstracts um, from meetings in addition to um, full publications. Um, Enbase, which is the abstract and indexing database, which includes a lot of uh, European publications that may not be available um, in PubMed. Um, and then some other uh, sort of less systematic databases like Current Contents and Google Scholar, some search, and then this TRIP database, which allows you to search by particular topics. Um, so I'm not going to go um, too much into um, how to use PubMed because I'm assuming that you're all familiar with how to use PubMed, but I'm, I'm going to show you a couple of um, the features that may be particularly useful um, in terms of keeping up with the medical literature. So I often have fellows ask me, what should I be reading? <laughs> so here's a list of what I think you should be reading. I'm just joking, because this is crazy. That nobody could ever read this. Um, so, uh, so this is a list of sort of the, the major journals in general neurology and the major journals in epilepsy, um, some of the major journals in internal medicine that may include articles on epilepsy that are clinically important. So you really, you know, there's no way you could read all of these. But you might want to think about reading the table of contents of all of these um, every week um, and looking to see whether there are, there are papers that are of interest to you for epilepsy. So you can actually get um, an email with the journal table of contents from each of these journals um, every time there's a new publication. That's sometimes a little bit of email overload. Or you can create an RSS feed from PubMed that will send you a list of all of the new publications um, from a specified set of journals. And I'll, I'll show you an example of this uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, so keeping an eye on what's being published in these journals is probably not a bad idea. And having a system of reading the abstracts from these journals is probably also not a bad idea. So what's the easiest way to, to actually do that? So I already mentioned the email with the journal table of contents. Um, these usually have links back to the abstracts on the journal website or links to PubMed where you can look at the abstract, um, the RSS fields from uh, feeds from PubMed. And then there are a few new mobile apps which will actually send you updates based on specific journals and specific keywords. Um, so have any of you used um, uh, something called READ by QXMD? No? All right, so I'll show you a little bit about that. So this is a... Um, uh, an, a mobile app. Um, it also has a web app, but the web app is actually far more clunky than the than the um, uh, than the web apps are. Um, so this allows you to um, uh, set up a series of keywords and journals that you want to follow. It will send you the abstracts that meet with um, that meet your selected criteria. And um, if you uh, are lucky enough to be in an institution that um, uh, links with uh, QXMD, then you can uh, link to the full text and actually pull up the PDFs uh, right on your mobile device and, and read them. So let's go to the QXMD website. Um, so here's an example. So I'm logged in now. So you can actually set your profile and your notifications. Um, this is a list of featured papers in neurology. And you could click on this. Um, it gives you the abstract of the paper. And then um, you, if, the, if the information is free, you can actually pull up a PDF. Um, and read it immediately. So that can be incredibly helpful 
is like really good while you're waiting for the train or for somebody to show up for dinner. You can do a little literature review. Um, if um, uh, and so this sort of gives you all of the sort of hot topics in general neurology. Mm -hmm. But what's more useful is you can set up um, uh, journals that you will follow and you can choose the journals based on your particular areas of interest. So for example, if you chose epilepsy, this will give you a list of all of the most recent papers published from epilepsy. And um, this is not, um, this does not have a link to free text, I don't think. And for some reason, I broke my proxy connection to the server. But if it were working, it would pull up the PDF just like it did with that free PDF. Um, so again, it gives an, uh, the abstract itself. Um, if there were any comments, um, so you can post commentary to this for other people to see. Um, and um, you can link to the PubMed reference if you want to try to pull up the um, reference yourself without going through the proxy server. You can also set up keywords for yourself. So here are the things that I um, have set up. And so for example, uh, status epilepticus. So this will give me the most recent papers that are published in status epilepticus. And we can click on this. And my library doesn't actually subscribe to this, so I won't be able to pull up the PDF. Um, but it's very quick to just sort of read down this list of um, uh, titles and abstracts and get an idea of what's been published and what kinds of things you may want to actually search out and, uh, and look at. Um, this will also send you email alerts um, on a periodic basis, um, depending on um, what your criteria are for, for um, uh, for alerts, I think you can do it once a week or once a month. Um, it will send you basically the the searches that match your keywords or your followed uh, your followed journals. Um, so this can be incredibly helpful, but it's it's a little hard to go from this to organized references, but it at least will um, you know give you some idea that new information has been published. Um, I kind of think of this as a, a more a quick alert service, not something I use to do systematic research in a particular area. Um, what I do use to do systematic research uh, in a particular area is PubMed and using the RSS feeds from, um, from PubMed. So um, how many of you have done RSS feeds from PubMed? So there's really good tutorials that are available on the PubMed website. And so you just go to PubMed and look for tutorials. It'll actually tell you um, how to sign up for My NCBI, which is the um, uh, personalized part of PubMed where you can set up uh, saved searches and set up RSS feeds. Um, so let me just show you an example of how that works. So this is PubMed here. Um, there's a little um, uh, sign in up at the top here. Let me sign in. Um, so now you can see that I'm signed in here. Um, and so I have access to my personal NCBI site. So when I go to that, um, uh, I have my bibliography here, and so um, for many NIH grants now, and uh, when you turn in your biosketch, you need to give a link to your online bibliography, and so this is a good place to actually create your bibliography because you can search from it right in PubMed, so that's really useful. It'll give you a list if you were signed in when you did your search. It'll actually give you a list of your most recent um, searches. And then you can do um, uh, searches in particular topic areas. So here's my search on status epilepticus. 
and it gives me a list of all of the um, papers that meet this. It tells me how many new papers are from the last time it sent me an alert. So um, there were, um, I got an alert last Saturday, and so there's been five new additions to um, to PubMed on Status Epilepticus since I last got a, a list of um, uh, email list of new publications. So I have this set up so that um, on a Saturday, once a month, I get an update on all of the um, uh, new papers in the areas that I um, do clinical research in. Um, I told you I would also give you a way to keep up with the medical literature. So this is a search that I put together that um, uh, takes all of the major medical journals like JAMA, New England Medicine, et cetera, and searches them for uh, the words seizures, epilepsy, and EEG, and sends me a list of everything published in those major medical journals, which tend to be pretty high-impact papers um, whenever there's a paper published about seizures, epilepsy, or EEG. So that can also be, I don't have those emailed to me, but if you ever wanted to kind of see what's up in the last six months uh, in, in the general medical literature, this can be a place to, to go for that. I'm going to talk a little bit about organizing um, your references. And um, uh, there are a lot of different um, software packages that are available that will allow you to um, store your online searches and um, actually store even the references and keep them organized. I'm going to talk in, in um, about a couple of them that I use personally. Um, and then I have a summary of some of the other ones that are available. So the basic functions that you want from your reference management software is to find the relevant literature, so how to search the relevant literature, um, how to store the references so that you have the titles and the abstracts available so you can retrieve them later. Reading, so many of the um, uh, reference management software now allows you to actually download and save the PDF documents um, right in the reference management software so that you now have a library with links to all of the full text documents. And many of them actually allow you to annotate and make comments on the PDF so you can save your own um, notes about the articles. This is way, way better than having stacks of printed out papers with sticky notes all over them that you can never remember what you actually read and didn't read. Um, and then um, the other function that's incredibly important is organization of these references and formatting the references for when you're actually writing your grants and writing your papers. Um, the, um, uh, the reference management software formats the bibliography into whatever um, format is required for the journal or the funding source. Um, so um, many of the um, software packages allow you to import things from PubMed or other bibliographic databases. Um, and um, uh, sometimes you can even share these references. Um, so EndNode and Mendeley allow you to um, share your reference list with other people. I don't know why other people would care what I'm reading, but whatever. Um, you can store the um, references in multiple different formats um, and actually store all of the actual um, PDFs um, and uh, update the metadata from the PDFs. Um, many of the services now actually have a function that you can do an automated full text search. So you, you do a search for particular references, you save the ones that you want to find, and then you just say, find the full text, and it'll go in, authenticate with your library service, and actually download um, all of the full text references to the file. Um, uh, you can organize this. Um, uh, many of the software packages have ways to group your references into specific um, categories or may automatically um, uh, create groups if you ask it to do that. So for example, if you had a bunch of papers on EEG and one would have on, you know, um, uh, technical aspects of EEG or EEG in children or neonatal EEG, you could create automatic groups 
um, based on that. Um, some of them allow you to share your libraries or share parts of the libraries with other people. Um, you can read the PDFs, um, and many of them, as I already mentioned, have uh, an integrated PDF viewer where you can highlight and add notes to the PDFs, um, and then uh, creating your bibliography. So two um, of the ones that I want to just comment on, one is EndNote. So EndNote has Windows and Mac versions. It allows you to search multiple different databases. Um, it imports the full text, and um, uh, you can actually take a bunch of PDFs and drag and drop them into EndNote, and it will go and find the metadata and organize them for you. Um, you can um, uh, uh, upload your um, library to the web, including attachments, so you can use it from anywhere. It's probably the most flexible bibliography formatting reference manager. Um, allows you to group things and sort them, and it's available on the iPad. The downside is it's pretty expensive, it's about $250. It's a little cheaper with the academic version, and it's not identical to the searches that you would find in PubMed. The other um, that I wanted to mention is Mendeley, and this is very popular because it's free. It has desktop versions for Windows, Macs, and, Macs and Linux. Um, and um, it has very good integration between the desktop and the web-based view. Um, there's versions for the iPhone and the iPad, and it allows you to mark up the PDF. Um, it's a little clunky in terms of search and import, although they have improved it quite a bit, and the reference metadata um, editing is not as good, I don't think, as in um, uh, EndNote, but that's just a personal preference. So, um, so I would encourage you to think about um, how to organize your literature searches and um, how to um, uh, keep your PDFs and, and all of your um, topic organization in one place. If you guys have any questions about any of these options, please feel free to email me and I can um, provide some more information for you. And, I'll post um, uh, these slides on uh, Epilepsy Connection, AES Connection, so that uh, you'll be able to look at the links, et cetera. All right, thank you all very much.